All right, this is your show now. All right, well, let's start with a happy question. Well, wait a minute. Before we do that, uh oh, I got an email co- following up something else that was on the experience this past week. See, I've, I actually prepare for these things. Um, we talked about the football fetish that a lot of the, the guys have when, when uh, whether it was WCW or WWFE or TNA or whenever a pro football player shows up because so many of the promoters, office members, and the guys themselves are football marks that they tend to lose their minds and put the football player over like the wrestler should be in trouble when they face each other rather than not only doing what's good for business and making the football player seem the sympathetic figure who's a man and tough, but he's in over his head in a wrestling environment or the thing that makes actual legitimate sense, which is in a legitimate contest, a high level wrestler a professional is going to be able to just stretch the shit out of any football player unless they have a high level wrestling background. And I think almost everybody in the NFL would agree with that. Would you, would you not think for fuck's sake, everybody knows that now they may think it's a pro wrestler and it's, he's phony. Well, if he is phony, couldn't stretch him in a shoot, but a high level wrestler who you would think a professional would be, would honestly be able to stretch the shit out of, most normal pro football players. I think this is common knowledge, correct? Because it's a completely different fucking sport. It's common knowledge to a point. I'm sure there are many football players who think, oh, I can go take those wrestlers. Well, yeah, and once again, if if they're, you know, with a beer bottle at the bar after a few drinks, then yes, it is the game on. But if we're talking about much the same as a wrestler trying to play football at the pro football player's level and would be in over his head unless he had a high-level college or pro football background. The same thing would apply if in a legitimate shoot, which this is all supposed to be, a professional football player was trying to wrestle a wrestler. So, the, But the point I was making is that so many times because the guys are marks and because all the people in the wrestling business suddenly lose their minds when they get a chance to feature a football player and, and lose track of what they're doing because they know, well, that's real. They're real. Yeah, but dummy. <laughs> so, is, so are you. You're supposed to be. So anyway. We made this mention when talking about the Pat McAfee and Adam Cole thing, where now Pat McAfee is not only the heel and, but also knocked out Adam Cole colder than a banker's heart before they're, they're having even have the match. So Andrew from Chattanooga, uh, sent this comment in because I've said, I don't know anything about football, but, uh, you know, the, just the logic of this was off to me. And Andrew says, Jim, you're absolutely right about the football fetish. As a football fan, however, I have to point out one thing you missed about this whole shit show of an angle. Pat McAfee was a punter. Punters in the football world have been presented forever as not real athletes who can't hold the jock of the real important players. (laughs) And this jack off is being presented as a threat to the top guy of NXT for over a year. So even if a football player is supposed to be real, It's a fucking punter. This just sucks because the guy isn't a wrestler and even by football logic isn't even a fucking athlete. Fuck this match. Adam Cole deserves better. So apparently the punters aren't even the tough guys on the football team. Well, let's not generalize everyone under that banner. I mean, again, I said last time he's not Lawrence Taylor. He's not even Steve McMichael. He's not that level of star. But... He's certainly an athlete. Let's not put him down and say that he's... Ah, oh, I know. He, yes, he's an athlete, and he has to do all the football training things that football training people do. Yes, I understand it. But once again, you've still... It, 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 I'm not justifying bringing him in and having him go over any wrestlers. I'm not just well, no, that. It's not, it's not, I'm not even talking about the finish. I'm talking about the way that it's sold. You don't want to bring in a big time pro sports superstar and just beat him and make him look bad. But at the same time, you need to resist your markish 
inclinations, football fans in wrestling power, you know, positions to fawn over the football player at the expense of the wrestler that's going to be working for you when the football player goes back playing football. And it, it's been done properly with, you know, Dr. Death Steve Williams was pushed from the start in Mid-South, but people forget he was not only an All-American football player, he was an All-American wrestler, too, at a major, uh, you know, American college. So, no, you don't have to present that guy as being in over his head with a pro wrestler. But uh, uh, Lawler in Memphis got a couple of guys from the old what was who had the Memphis Showboats? What was it? USFL or USFL? There, there was, yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. See, I know this because of the wrestling connection. There was a couple of minor league football leagues that had teams in Memphis, and he got a guy named Ron Mikulogic and a and a guy named Mike Stark, and that's where they brought them in as big, huge, fucking guys, obviously professional athletes and local celebrities, but then Lawler would cut the promo mocking them. And making fun of them. And you're in over your head when, when you come to, a, you know, getting a wrestling business. You know, you, you you quit football because your knees got hurt. Well, your knees can get hurt in wrestling too, right? And this was with uh, Mikulogic, I think. Or was it Stark? I came interchangeable. A few years apart. But anyway, uh, you know, he fucking tells the fucking football player off. And the football player says, well, we'll fucking find out you know, when the match comes about or whatever, and he starts to leave and Lawler takes a fucking chair and fucking kneecaps him with the metal folding chair. Your knees can get hurt in wrestling just like football, boy. And you get heat on the fucking heel that's going to face the football player and make the football player look not only like he's in over his head in a wrestling environment, but he's still a big, tough man, but he's sympathetic and then when you give them the match, then you figure out some way to put the fucking football player over without making the wrestler look bad. But you give the people what they paid for in the end. But you don't just, oh, God, it's Pat McAfee. Adam Cole's going to be fucked in this one. It, that's just putting in putting guest stars over your main stars and other sports being portrayed as tougher or more legitimate or more difficult than your own, which is... I don't think any fucking makes any sense whatsoever. But that's just me. Steve Williams played for the USFL. Yes, he did. Did he? At New Jersey Generals, I that's think, right. wasn't it? That's right. I know that because of the wrestling connection. Jeff Gaylord was in the USFL. Well, and, and see, not all fucking USFL football players can be introduced to wrestling with a lot of fanfare. Yeah, there's a wild story about him in the book. There's a great book, Football for a Buck, and it had a Jeff Gaylord story in there. And it's always weird reading about wrestling personalities and non-wrestling books. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. All, All right. right, this is your fucking show. I have a follow-up for you. Okay, please do. I got my copy of Football for a Buck by Jeff Perlman here. A fantastic book. You don't have to be a football fan to enjoy this book. Jeff Perlman also wrote one of the best baseball books ever. The Bad Guys Won about the 1986 Mets. But here's a uh, short section from page 31 into page 32. Perhaps the best training camp narratives belong to a pair of Boston Breakers. First, there was Jeff Gaylord, a nose tackle and former fourth-round draft pick of the Los Angeles Rams, who, while attending the University of Missouri from 1978 to 1982, went on a five-month cocaine binge that, he recalled, fried my brain, <laughs> agreed to fill in for an absent male stripper at the nightclub where he worked as a bouncer. Gaylord purchased a tin of green paint, coated his body head to toe, and nicknamed himself the Incredible Hulk. That night, he was arrested for indecent exposure <laughs> and fined $50. Filled his body with every imaginable steroid and steroid knockoff and served as a certified chiropractor who arrived early to the stadium to crack his teammates backs before <laughs> games. Now, you would think that's where it ended because there's nothing else wrestling related. Well, let me finish this just looking through this. This is funny. The other breaker of note was Billy Don Jackson, a one time standout defensive end at UCLA who arrived in camp less than four months after wrapping an eight-month stay at the L.A. County Jail 
and Wayside Honor Rancho for manslaughter. On, uh, on October 27th, 1980, Jackson allegedly killed 28-year-old Mark Bernalak in an argument over marijuana. The quote, I remember being told that Billy Don beat the man to death with a tennis racket <laughs> during a drug deal gone bad, said David Canteo, who covered the breakers for the Boston Herald. Well, the day I interviewed him, they set us up in a private room, and I turned around and I noticed a pile of tennis rackets stacked up against the wall near his chair. So there it is. Somehow it tied into Cornette at the very end. <laughs> Death by tennis racket. See, for all those people who say that's a bullshit gimmick. It just depends on which direction you swing it. 